again. I'm Paul White, and this is my book, Forged, Traditional Blacksmithing of the Frontier Knife. Today, we're going to talk about putting a handle on your knife with rivets in the traditional way. So, let's have a look. Rivets are an ancient method to attach your scales to your handle. Uh, but there's problems. When we rivet metal to metal, there's rarely any problem. There's the rivet, head, head, metal, metal. However, with softer materials like bone and wood, the heads can recess, and that's a bad thing because it doesn't hold like it should. The worst thing that can happen, it happens too frequently for most smiths, even experienced ones, is that the tops and the bottoms fall over. They get smushed in the wrong direction. They don't stand up straight and tall, and it usually splits the scale. Here's a knife rivet. There's the edge of the knife there. Here's the wood or other material. Here's a rivet standing nice and tall with a nice mushroom on either end. And the mushroom actually goes into the wood or the bone just a bit. Notice around the rivet though, there's a jacket. This is a tube. This is a method I've developed called tube rod peening where your rivet actually rides, lives, inside a tube that goes through the handle and it supports the rivet as you peen it over, making it almost impossible to bend it. Here's a larger version of the same deal. You can see the edge of your blade here. Here's your scales, your rivet. Here is the jacket the tube around the rivet and that's what makes it rigid. That's what keeps it from falling over. You can put tremendous riveting pressure on either end without tragic consequences. Now once upon a time when they handled a knife they didn't have the materials that we use today. Most knives today are put together with pen and epoxy holds the handle together quite nicely. Now some guys will pin the pin, the brass pin a little bit. Uh, the pin becomes a pin. Uh, and then they'll sand it flat and smooth. We don't. Once upon a time, they would take a blade, put holes in it, and then they would hold it together with some fashion of a nut and a bolt on either end, and then they would pin through the center of the center rivet there. So everything was held in place because they didn't have epoxy. Another way was to use C-clamps, which makes sense. They also used pine tar. Uh, pine tar would go between the knife uh, handle, the metal, and the scales. And pine tar held just long enough to drill the holes and place the peen. That's all you wanted it to do. The pine tar wasn't an epoxy of sort. Now, I've used pine tar. It's messy. Uh, so I give you permission, instead of using pine tar, to use contact cement. It uh, works the same way. Now, the contact cement doesn't hold the handle to the knife permanently. All it does is holds it long enough for you to peen it. So. We would go from something like this to something like this. Now, there's only two dimensions you need to remember when doing this method. One is a 532nd tube. This one comes from uh, Ace Hardware. They also have 1 8 inch rod. 532nd tube, 1 8 inch copper rod, 1 8 inch brass rod. This is actually a brazing rod, but it's 1 8. You can also use copper nails. These copper nails are sometimes used in the roofing industry and sometimes in the boat industry uh, to hold wooden parts together so they won't rust. 
So what you wind up with, if you can notice this, is a rod inside a tube. So the tube supports the rod. So this is uh, how it goes, how it works. Here's three actual little rod and tube pins that would be embedded in the knife handle. Uh, over here, you can see we have the two scales. I'll show you how to use these washers in the peening process. And then we need some kind of a reamer. Here's an old-timey reamer for a brace and bit. And what we use the reamer for is to ream out, whoops, here we are, is to ream out the tube. I can't stress enough how important it is to keep your tubes clear and clean so that your rods move freely in the tube. So some kind of reamer helps to do that. You can also use the end of a, a small file to again ream out your tube. Now be careful with the tubes because they collapse when you clamp them in the vise to cut them and other things. So they're strong, but you can bend them fairly easily. Here's a, uh, a scratching stylus I made. Uh, we have a four-sided uh, point, hardened pretty hard, and it works also well as a reamer. Here is just simply the, a visual aid to remind you, five thirty seconds on the tube and on here, five thirty seconds on the tube and one eighth on the actual pin, rivet, pin. Let me show you how this is done. Here is our knife. We've drilled our three five thirty second holes all the way through the scale that has been contact cement id <laughs> to the knife handle. Next, we're going to contact cement this side of the scale and then drill down through this way to line our holes up perfectly. Now, the second side of the scale has been placed and drilled. The contact cement is holding that handle on just long enough for us to put the tube and peens in, the tube rod and peens. So I'm going to drive this first tube in. I can put my fingers down here and feel, feel it going. If it stops for some reason, oh, hear that sound? It's all the way through. There you can see it. So we go to the vise. This vise was built in Chicago in 1854. That's a significant date because it's the date that the Bessemer process was patented for you history buffs out there. Okay. So then we simply file these little knobbies flat. And we can have the file come in contact with the scale because we're going to clean all that up. And by driving the tube through the scales and the handle, we know that rascal is snug. So then we ream it out with either the official reamer, let's use this one on the other side, let's use the tang of a, of a file. So whatever floats your boat, then we can take any of these 1 8 rods and see if it's going to fit through. And it does, perfectly. Here's the uh, 1 8 brazing rod perfectly. Now you can see that we have all three of the tubes placed and reamed clear. Always clear it. Always make sure that you don't have any debris 
in any of the three holes because it will really put a put a stop to your work so inside these we'll have this is how the pins will look now these pins aren't going in the knife but I'm just showing you how the copper rod goes through the brass pin so we'll use the nails because they're the hardest but we're gonna make a, a rod out of it we'll get my old timey wire cutters here and we'll snip off the end we'll simply now what you want to do when you paint you want to have kind of a flattish roundish head on your paint because you want it to roll down into a mushroom all at once that's kind of what you want you can see it's flat on the top but the sides are rounded so we place it through where there's about an eighth of an inch poking out and then we take our wire cutters and we guess about what an eighth of an inch is on the other side and we did good now what I'll do is flatten up the other side a little bit the exciting thing about this is that I'm sure this is the way it was done in the olden days and I'm sure there's some features, procedures that you could do a lot faster with power equipment but it's not nearly as much fun so both those are ready to go now now as an added feature I'm going to peen these things on what I call the war anvil I have in my possession a revolutionary war anvil from England and this anvil came over on uh, on one of King George III's ships of war that's how I got here and then the colonial boys took it away from the British it's pretty exciting to have it it's a long story I go over the story in my book about how I got it so here's another blacksmith trick here's a quarter inch thick washer the knife goes here the pin goes in the tube and then you just begin to paint straight down you don't have to hit it heavy just hit it a lot and that pin will that edge will fall over now what's happening on the other side is exactly the same thing but it's going against the anvil you can see how it's already widened a little bit but I flip it so that we can make it uniform even though my wood's got that ugly chunk missing I just left that there to show you how you can still paint something nicely even though the wood's not working with you. Now at some point, your paint's gonna go down pushing the horizon. So at this point, you can either pull the thick washer out or put in a 1 8 inch washer. And see how it makes the rivet come up a little proud. Now the rivet's still moving inside the tube, but in a few more peens, it won't do that. It's gonna be snug. Now you can hear that metal on metal. We don't hear any wood on hammer. We flip it again. I think I'm gonna go just straight anvil this time. And I'm looking for that metal on metal sound. Tap, 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 goes the blacksmith. I flip it, I do the other side. no splits now when we do the end that's where it usually splits if it's gonna split but it doesn't and it doesn't because that jacket of brass 
holds that copper pin where it needs to be. And if you can calculate how much collective force there is, if we added all those little peen taps up, I mean, the pressure uh, would be tremendous. What it would be, I have no idea. But now I'll do the other two. So here we are with the finished rivets. You can see I've peened all three of them, just like we did the first one, across the war anvil. Now what we'll do is we'll take a rasp and sandpaper sticks and we'll take all this excess wood off so that when we're finished, it'll look like this knife made by one of my best students. He learned to make that knife in a weekend with me. Look at that rascal. But any kind of knife you make, whether it be a hunter like this one, the same deal. The rivets work the same regardless of the knife that you're making. And this was taught to me by my friend Gus. There's a picture of Gus Marie, an old blacksmith. Thank you, Gus.